Um, so uh, welcome to week four. Uh, let me just get our lecture notes up on the screen. Can you see? And, and make it a bit bigger. Go to the schedule. And we're now in week four, which is a long way down. Arrays, it's called. Go to Richard's bullet points. And here's today's lecture. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, first of all, I, I wanted to thank you all for your uh, tips in the labs last week. A lot of people actually went uh, toots. You had to, if you remember, come up with some suggestions for um, how I could get fit. And a lot of people took it quite seriously, it seems, and put some quite serious suggestions. A lot of people were very rude and sarcastic. <laughs> uh, and a lot of people uh, took it seriously. So thanks very much for the suggestion, everyone for the suggestions. And I was looking through them all. Uh, and I decided, uh, I mean, basically the problem is, here we are, four weeks into semester. I vowed at the beginning of semester I would get fit. I'm four weeks into semester and I'm not getting fit. Why not? When I get to this situation, I think it's time to take a good, hard look at what's going on, which we call reflection, which means I should sit back and think about what's working and what's not working, and I should be analytical about it. Instead of just wistful and optimistic and thinking, oh, I'll just keep trying and eventually I'll get fit, I should say, well, I've got enough data now over four weeks to look at, see what's been going on, and to work out what's going wrong and to try and fix it up. Now, everyone had some good suggestions, and in the um, next lecture, as in on Wednesday, I'll go through... Um, uh, I'd like to categorise them into sort of categories of suggestions, and I'll tell you which ones I'm following and which ones I'm not. Uh, I mean, which ones I'm, I mean, I'm going to try and follow everything, but the ones I think are the best, um, the most helpful, that is. But I sort of wanted to draw a parallel between that and your programming, which is, you're now four weeks into semester, uh, and you've just done your first major task, and you've all handed it in, um, and uh, now you probably have a fair idea for how you're going and um, problems and, uh, and sort of things you need if you're completely happy with where you are or if you're not happy with where you are. And four weeks into semester, of course, is great. It's like, for me, there's still time for me to get fit. Yeah, I haven't blown it completely. You haven't blown it either. You're in a really good position now, but if you're not happy with how you're going, it's probably time to do this sort of reflection thing, to stand back and look at what you've been doing over the last four weeks and look at where you are now and think about where you want to be. And instead of just being wistful and optimistic, oh, Sorry. take that for being late. I will strike the next... You two, I've got to come and hit you to be fair to everyone. No, just joking. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> okay, um, so it was, it was quite scary there for a little moment. Luckily, I have this move that I learned from the movies that no one attacks you when you do that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so um, yeah, look, if you're not happy with your programming, or even if you are, it's probably a really good time now, four weeks into semester, we're still just starting, but you've got a bit of data, to do this thing we call reflection, which is analytical, and it's not just wistful and making it up and ad hoc, you're a scientist of some sort. You're structured, you're formal, you're rigorous, you're not just going to be ad hoc and wishy-washy. So what you should probably do now is sit down and write down what you've done, write down where you want to be, and write down some sort of plan. Now, if you're a, an A person, and remember we're calling the A people the people that had never programmed before they came to this course, and we're not feeling completely confident about their ability to do this course. Um, four weeks in now, you've started to learn how to program. You've started to close the gap between you and the C. So I think um, at the end of this week, we'll be four weeks in, you should, you should be closing the gap. Until now, it's been, you know, they've just been way ahead of you. Now they're starting to sort of move in sight. They'll still be finding things easier than you. Like that last assignment probably took you at least four times as long as it took them, possibly more. But the next assignment will probably only take you two times as long as it takes them. And when we get up to the project, the gap will have closed. And you'll be spending each all the same amount of time and effort. You're learning a whole lot of stuff that they already know. But it's just stuff. So who cares about stuff, eh? Yeah, anyone can learn stuff. All of you at the same time are hopefully learning a whole lot of skills. So I would suggest everyone sit down and do a reflection. In fact, someone suggested we do it as part of the diary. Not accessible, but I strongly suggest everyone do it, and certainly it'll make the tutors happy when they're marking your diary. Go back to your diary now that you've already, you know, the assignment's finished, and put one final entry in and call it reflection. And in that, say, well, here's sort of what I learned from doing that task, and here's where I am, and here's where I'd like to be, and here's what my sort of plan for the future is. So I'd really like everyone to do that. Now, uh, we don't require anyone to do that because, of course, a reflection exercise fails if you just... You can just do it tokenly and it's irrelevant. It's like 
New Year's resolutions. If you don't live up to your New Year's resolution, it's only you that knows you're not living up to it. It's only you that can fix it. No one can force you or compel you. So, you know, we're not compelling you. But I strongly suggest everyone do it. And certainly it'll make your diary look better. To sit down and write down um, what you think you learned from the assignment and where you want to be. Now, if you're an A person and you're still not happy with your programming, you'll never be completely happy with your programming. Yeah, yeah, there's always more to learn. But you might want to look at how much time you're spending practicing. And maybe you're not spending 20 minutes every day. Maybe you're doing it in a mad rush just before the labs each week. You know, maybe you're doing, maybe you're doing it late at night when you're tired. Maybe you're so stressed about it, you're putting it off, which is what I do with my sort of plans to get fit. If something stresses you, you put it off, well, don't do that. Or maybe you do it in the evening when you're not feeling so good, don't do that. Pick the best time of the day if you work out a way that every day you can spend some practice. I think everyone, no matter how long they've been programming, needs to do a bit of practice every day throughout this course. And so doubly so, if you're an A person, you need to be doing a little bit every day. So think about how you can make yourself do that. It's hard. Only you can make yourself do that. Only you can know if you're doing that. No one else will know. So I had a look at the task ones that were handed in uh, and as they were coming in. And I've been watching people's diaries as you've been writing them to get a sense for how people have been going. And I must say I was very proud of um, every single thing I looked at. It was quite awesome. So a whole lot of people who were nervous, quite clearly from their diary and not thinking that they could program already, put in magnificent efforts. And uh, it was fantastic. So I just wanted to congratulate everyone for task one. Remember, the important thing about task one isn't getting it all completely done. If you can program already, I expect you get it all completely done. I expect it to be perfect. You'll only lose a few marks if you fail a few tests. But if you can already program, I want you to think that if you haven't passed every single test, that's a disaster. It's not as though, oh, it's 90% right or 95% right. Everyone that can already program should pass every single test. If you fail even a single one, then you've got to sit back and think, oh, bugger, I blew it completely. Don't worry about your mark and sit and think about, oh, how can I make sure next time I don't blow it completely? If you couldn't program before, then damn well doing anything is fantastic. If you get it printing the numbers in any range, a lot of people only got up to 1,000. Some people got up to just under a million. Anyone doing something like that that couldn't program before, that is fantastic. So well done. Because you must have used abstraction. You must have used function. You must have hit problems. And you must have had to debug. And you must have sat down and attacked those problems. And you must have solved some of them. And that's fantastic. They're the skills we want you to get. So well done to everyone. So be completely proud of what you've done. But also sit back and think, gee, next time, how could I have done it better? Uh, now, what do we want to say? Task one, congrats. Oh, that's sort of what I was saying then. I just really, I did feel quite moved as I was looking through everyone's task one submissions. I just thought, wow, that's so cool. And my wife, uh, uh, or in fact, lots of my friends that I know are in jobs where they form a, a low opinion of human nature and human ability and human potential and human morals and human ethics and values. They see the worst side of the human nature. And I always have to say to everyone, guys, you should be a teacher. Because when you're a teacher, you see these fantastic things. You see people that can't do something who are so stressed and freaked out that they can't do it, but they don't give up. And they keep going. And they get there. And it's just this story of perseverance and amazingness. So looking at all the assignments, it was completely awesome for me. So thank you very much for letting me have that experience. And reflection, yeah, I've said that already. OK. Um, aim to complete tutes and labs. I sort of said this last week, but I want to make it clearer this week. You should complete all your tutes and labs. It's not good to think, oh, good, I got one of my lab marks. You've got to get everything. And if you don't get it all out, then get it out after the due date and don't get a mark for it, but still finish it. Don't leave it undone one week, and then the next week get one lab mark, and, the next keep, and then you're leaving this great chunk of work undone. That's going to snowball and just completely wipe you out, because everything relates to everything relates to everything in previous weeks. So if you haven't finished it last week's tutes and labs, make sure you finish them now. And if you haven't started this week's Tutes and Labs, which went up on Friday, and I'm trying to get them out earlier every week, if you haven't started them, for heaven's sake, start them now. There's no way you could turn up to the start of your lab and get the lab done in the lab. Yeah, it's not possible. So you don't do that. You, your lab should sort of be finished when you turn up to the lab. Some of the questions relate to the Tutes, so you're going to have problems doing those. You might have to wait to finish those ones off and polish them off in the lab. But the lab time's not time to start looking at the questions for the first time. You have to do that for the first few weeks because of my incredible disasters in getting the exercises up early, for which I'm completely blaming everyone else in the world, but who, whose fault is it really? But, um, but from now on, I'm getting them up early. So please have a whack at them. And aim to get them all done. Someone suggested we put up some self-test exercises, which I think is a brilliant idea. So you'll notice I've started adding to the tutes extra non-assessable exercises at the bottom, which I just call something like self-test or warm-up or something like that. They're not accessible. You don't have to do them. But I suggest each week you try and do them, because that's what I think you should be able to do that week. And if anyone else, I might even, I will, put a link to a, a side page. So if anyone else wants to add their own self-test questions, you guys can build up a big bank of self-test questions that you set yourselves each week. 
Because I've got millions more questions that I could fit in the Tutes and Labs, so why don't I just write them down and you try and do them in your own time if you want some practice. Okay. All right, now where did we get up to at the end of last week? Last week. We were looking at this funny character here, this Ampersand. I wish I could draw that. It, it looks so simple. <laughs> Beyond me. What did Ampersand mean? If I put it in front of a variable name, what's it talking about? The address of what? Of the variable. Okay, let me just jump back to eight, um, the 8 bit machine code or our 4 bit machine code and just make this really clear what we're talking about here. Oh, that's fine. What does this program do? Uh, Uh, what does this program do? It prints 15. It stores register 1. Into register 1, it stores the number 2. What's that? The number stored at position 2. So what will be stored in register 1? 10. I want you to notice these two instructions are subtly different. I mean, of course they're different. One does printing and one does storing. But they're subtly different in how they do addressing, how we specify the data. This one here literally prints 15. The thing that follows the 8 is the data we want. The thing that follows the 10 is not the data we want. This will not store a 2 into register 1. This is what? The address of the data we want. The data we want is at number, address number 2, 0, 1, 2. What's the data we want? 10. 0, 1, 2. Does everyone see there's two different modes of addressing there? This is a very subtle distinction, and I bet all the time when you're programming, you're going to get them, whoa, throw chalk up your nose. Um, and then, after you've done that, I bet you'll um, always jumble these up. And in fact, all the experienced programmers and all the tutors were really cross at this 815 instruction. And everyone kept saying, can you, heavens, for heaven's sake, can you change this and introduce a new instruction where this isn't the literal data, it's the address of the data. Because they knew it was dangerous to have a mix of instructions where some of the instructions directly address data and some of them indirectly address the data. Because you're bound to get them jumbled up. It's human nature to mix these things up. Now, I have some funny examples of, um, I see this thing happening all the time. One funny thing I saw was on Lano and Woodley. Has anyone seen one, Lano and Woodley? Two very funny Australian comedians, yes. Uh, and one of their things, um, I can never remember which is which. Who's, who's the uh, loud, obnoxious one, and who's the really funny, tall, thin guy? Woodley's the thin guy. Okay, he's very funny and gangly and awkward. And Lano, who's the sort of like the straight guy, goes, uh, hang, he's got a picture, and he says, where shall I hang it? And Lano goes, hang it there, and points to the wall. And what does Woodley do? Hangs it on the tip of his finger. <laughs> he was making the same mistake. This was an address. It was not the location. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Years ago, when I was trying to explain to my students the difference between what's stored at an address and the location of the address, I, I was struggling to find out, think of good examples, and I couldn't think of any. And I asked everyone in the class, can anyone think of a really compelling example of this? And everyone sort of talked amongst themselves. And then, and then I went around the room sort of listening to people's suggestions. And the best one, the funniest one, and I'm sad, embarrassed to say I can't remember the name of the person that suggested it, because it was literally 13 years ago or something. Um, he said, when you go... And you're walking through the building, because we were, uh, we, it was a late night lecture and everyone used to duck out for a break in the middle. There was a big sign outside that said, gents. And he said, that tells, and there was like an arrow to a door. And he said, that tells you the toilet's in there. That is not the toilet. So we had this little mnemonic or whatever, a little thing we remember, which was don't piss on the sign. <laughs> okay. We're going to make this mistake over and over again in our programming. We're going to mix up the address and the thing it's referring to. We're going to get them all jumbled up. It happens all the time. Um, so, yeah, this means the address of the variable, the location of memory where it's stored, it doesn't mean the variable itself. I guess I, there's no point in me laboring the point now because we haven't started to use it. But just remember that as we program from now on, you're always going to be in danger of mixing those two things up, talking about the address of a variable and talking about the variable itself. Um, okay. Let's, I wanted to do some examples of that, so let's do that. I'm going to jump to my laptop. Let's start using the ampersand a bit. 
Uh, let's load uh, Xcode up. Xcode. Okay, and let's go. I created a project just before I came down here that we'll use, so open a recent project, and I called it week four, lecture one. It's main.c. Here's, here's my program. Let's have a look at it. Hash includes stdio.h, and then typedef unsigned char byte. Why did I have that line in there? Because I found I wanted to use unsigned chars today to demonstrate something. And I kept typing unsigned char b1, unsigned char b2, unsigned char b3, unsigned char b4. And I thought, I'm sick of writing unsigned char. I wish there was some abbreviation I could use. So I did. I called uh, unsigned char, what did I call it? Byte. And from now on, whenever I say byte, I mean the type unsigned char. Not only did it save me typing, because you know, I'm not one to care much about whether we save typing or not. Um, not only did it save typing, though, I think it gave clarity. Because I wanted an unsigned char because it was representing one byte on the computer. And I want us to have variables that take up exactly one byte. So for me, the word byte is meaningful, whereas unsigned char is not meaningful. Oh, by the way, do you guys remember what unsigned char means? What does the unsigned mean there? They're all positive values. We're not going to split the range of values in half and say half is positive and half is negative. All the values we're going to represent as positive numbers. So it lets us go twice as far in the positive direction, but doesn't let us represent negative numbers as well. And that's fine. So notice I've declared here one, two, three, four, five, six bytes and one int. Can everyone see that? And I've initialized them all to zero when I created them. And then I've got some code here. First of all, I print out hello world. I have no idea why I'm printing that out anymore. We can just say, you're gone. Uh, and then I'm printing out B1. Now look at these lines. It's a big chunk of code, but what's going on? B1 percent P percent X. So I'm printing out B1. And first of all, what do I print out? The address of B1. And then what do I print out next? The value of B1. So it's going to print out B1, and in brackets it's going to print the address. Percent %p means it's a pointer type, which means it's an address. We call addresses pointers, yeah, 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 because this number here too is pointing to somewhere. Where's it pointing to? Address 2. It's pointing to this cell here. So we call it a pointer. So an address is often called a pointer. So I'm printing it out in pointer notation. Now that's going to print it out as a hexadecimal number. A hexadecimal number is just another way of writing a normal number. It's, not a, it's, not a, it's nothing different, it's just a different way of writing it. So it's writing it in base 16 instead of in base 10. In base 16, we've got all the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, all the digits 0 to 9. And we've also got extra digits, which we need to stick in to represent six more values, and we stick in, what do we stick in? A, B, C, D, E, F, five more values. Why five more? Oh yeah, we've got 0 to 9, that gives us 10 values, and then we need... Uh, a, B, C, D, E, F. That is six, isn't it? So I thought I had four fingers. Only. I'm working base four. Okay. Yeah, four fingers, one thumb. But, you know. Okay, so yeah, that's right. So we've got all the digits in base 10, which is 10 of them, plus six more, which gives us 16, which is base 16, which is hexadecimal. Hex meaning, in Norse we would say, sucks, sucks, if you're from New Zealand. That's right. And so that's, that's how you get hexadecimal. Okay. Uh, so it's going to print it out in base 16. Why do we prefer printing things in base 16? Yeah? It's kind of like just a more complicated version of um, binary. That's easier to read. Yes. It's, it's easier to read. It's like binary, but it's easier to read because in computing, everything happens as a multiple of two. So a byte is going to store a number between 0 and 255. So we could print out a number between 0 and 255, but it stores exactly two hex digits. Because 16 squared is 256. So you get two lots of 16 in 256. So two hex digits is exactly going to be a byte. So when we print out our big long numbers in hex, if we take chunks of them two at a time, it's going to show us all the different bytes inside the number. And that's really convenient to know. So, uh, so that's why we're going to do it that way. OK, hexadecimal. And we're going to print out the, number, the value of B1. And I thought, well, what the heck? Let's just print it out in hexadecimal too. So if you want to print some, an integer in hexadecimal, or any numeric type in hexadecimal, we go percent x, and it'll print it out as a hexadecimal number. 
So we're going to print out the value in hexadecimal and the address in hexadecimal. All right, let's run our program. Oh, well, everyone have a guess. What do you think the output's going to be? Don't call it out. Just think in your head. I'm going to run this program. I'm going to get a table of values of addresses and contents of variables. What's that output going to look like? Let's have a look. Richard. Yes. Why do you have the, uh, in the main function at start? Why do you have constant in front of chart? Oh, did, oh, my thing stuck it in. Let's take it out. Um, it's a, a const is a, 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 sh a word to indicate that's only come out in the later version of C. Uh, is it C99? Does anyone know when did const drift in? C99. C99. It's a, C, like C was invented by these two guys. C89. C89. C was invented by these two guys who were very, very clever. And, but there was, uh, they were a bit hacky. You know, they didn't sort of write everything down. In fact, it was sort of self-documented in a book that describes C, the C language book. Or re what's it called? The C language reference? Or the C programming language? Which is a cool book to get, uh, if I could remember its title. But it's written by the guys that invented the language. It's the first thing they put out. And they're a bit hackery, so the book's a bit hackery. In. But it's very detailed. And it explains C. And there was nothing else except that book. And that was what C was. And everyone started to use it. They thought it was neat. But uh, different compilers made different assumptions about some things that were ambiguous in the book. So it started off that there were, in fact, the first two compilers that were ever written for C both had different assumptions in them. So the language wasn't really tightly defined, but everyone could see it was a neat language to use. And then over time, people thought it would be nice if there was a standard for this language. And there was something called ANSI C, the American National Standards Institute, I guess is ANSI. They put out a standard, and then other standards have come out, and there was a C. 89, which was a standard that came out in 1989, and then a C99, and there's probably a, some other ones. I can't remember. So whenever you're talking about C, it's very hard to know exactly what you mean. Now, the latest one to come out, the C99, had all this extra stuff stuck in it um, that a lot of people think is not good. So there's a bit of controversy about C99, and not everyone will program to C99. Uh, and I think const might have crept in in C99, and because there's a little bit of itchiness about using C99 stuff, I uh, haven't been using it up until now. Yes? Oh, because I want it. Why? That's a good question. Why are we using an unsigned character instead of an int? Does anyone else want to have a guess how I'm going to answer that question? I've got a good reason. Yes? Because ints will be a different size. Ints will be a different size. Well, right now, we're going to get the guts of the computer. We're going to start looking at addresses where things are stored and peep at the values. An int is probably going to take how much space on my machine. It's not defined in C. Remember I said C is not a very strongly... Well, it's one of the strengths of C that the size of int isn't defined, some people would argue, because you can put it on lots of different computers. But it's probably going to be four bytes. Yep. So an int's probably going to take um, eight hexadecimal numbers yep. in that range. Whereas a char is probably going to take one, one byte. Okay. So it's my closest way of getting a byte. What's that? Would you be able to read the address of an int? I can read the address of an int. I can read the address of anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Addresses on my machine are probably going to be the same size as an int. They're probably going to be four byte addresses. Okay. Probably. We'll see. We'll see when we start seeing them. There's no real way of knowing until we do it. Every machine's different. Well, there is a real way of knowing. Little aside, main lecture going on here. Little aside over here. There is a file you can import called limits.h. And if you put angle brackets limits.h, hash include limits.h, at the top of your file, it brings in a whole lot of hash defined constants, and they tell you how big things can get. So if I was to import it up here, if I was to say, this is still a side, OK? Hash include limits.h. I could print out uh, how big is an int. What, uh, what's the biggest int on this machine? Percent. Percent uh, D, I guess it can print it out as an int, can't it? Yeah, okay, because it's an int. Okay, backslash N. It's looking too, way too big. I'm going to put a continuation character in there. Oh no, I'm going to close the string. And just because we've got a very narrow screen, because the font's so big for the lecture. On this machine. Uh, and we'll print out, what's it called? I think it's int max. Int max has just been defined in this file that we just included. Now, every machine with a GCC compiler on it will probably have a limits.h there, 
And if you hash include it, it'll pick up all the sizes for your machine that you're using. Your machine might not have the same sizes as mine. You might use two bytes to store it in. <laughs> Very unlikely, but you might. You might use, you might have a 64 byte machine, a 64 um, bit machine, and you might have bigger ints. <laughs> unlikely, but you might. So all defined here. So this will print out for us how big the biggest int is on this machine. So that, did that answer your question as to why we're using unsigned char rather than ints? Yeah, okay. Let's run the program and see what it's going to look like. Uh, and it succeeded. Oh, I love seeing that message, uh, but I can't see the output. I have to go where? Run the console. Oh, what, and it's, why am I only seeing two? What's happened here? Let's try that again. I can't seem to be able to scroll on that. There's no scroll thingy on it. Let's just move it off to the side and say, do that again, please. Oh, in fact, there might even be a do it again button here. Here there is. Build and go. Here we are. What's the biggest int on this machine? That's the biggest int on this machine. How big is it? Well, let's look at it in groups of three. That's thousands. So that's up to a million. So that's up to a billion. So it's about two billion. What's that? Yeah, it's an int, which is a signed int. So two billion. Let's think two billion. How big is that? Well, a thousand is about three, um, uh, two to the power of three. Uh, sorry. Two to the power of three is about 10. 2 to the power of 10 is about 1,000. So if we've got 1,000, it takes about 10 bits. If we've got a million, it'll take about 20 bits. If you've got a billion, it'll take about 30 bits. So it's about 30 bits, plus it's double a billion, so it's about 31 bits. So we're looking at about 31 bits here, a bit of rounding going on. So that's about, uh, what, 2 to the... 2 to the 31 Yeah, it's about... Uh, uh, yeah, it's, is, is, it, is it 2 to the 31 minus 1? Well, that about was pretty close if it is. Um, so it's using 31 bits to represent that number. That's a, an int. And that makes sense to us, doesn't it? We expect to have 30, 2 to the 31 going up and 2 to the 31 in the minus numbers put together. That gives us twice as many as 2 to the 31 values, which is 2 to the 32. So it looks like we've got a 32-bit int. But suppose we couldn't do that. Suppose we didn't know about limits.h. Let's just do it with our address signs. I'm more interested in this data in here. Look at all of this. First of all, all the values are zero. Now, hopefully you predicted that because we were initializing them all to zero. But the addresses written in hexadecimal are not zero. Can you read that? Is that big enough? Wave at the back if it's not big enough. Yeah, OK, guys. Let's see if we can make that bigger. View. Someone saying text? Oh, thank you very much. Text. Oh. Oh, yeah, there's a way of doing that on the Mac, isn't there? How do I? Two fingers does something, doesn't it? <laughs> Next lecture, you guys got to sit closer to the front. Do you want to try moving down now so you can see it? Because it is important to see this. Everyone, there's a bit of space down the front. I'm sorry I can't make it bigger. I, yeah, I'm not going to do that now, though, because I don't, I don't want to waste time. But there's got to be a way I can make this bigger, but I don't know how. Oh, I know what I can do. Let's cut and paste it into another program. <laughs> Copy all that check. Text. Go into Text Wrangler. Paste it in. Is that big enough now? Wave if it's still a problem. OK, cool. All right, so let's look at the output we got here. B1 is stored at this address here. Now, that's an odd-looking address. OX, if it starts with a 0x, that's a little shorthand way of saying, oh, by the way, this number's in hexadecimal. It's really important to say that because it's possible a hexadecimal number just might not happen to have any letters in it at all, just like it's possible a decimal number might not happen to have anything except zeros and ones in it, like 1010. If you just look at 1010, how do you know it's a decimal number meaning 1010 and not a binary number meaning 10? How do you know that? Um, you don't unless someone says, oh, this is in binary, oh, this is in hex. So OX at the beginning says this is in hex, B F F F F F F F F F F 74 C. Well, B1's stored. Well, let's write them on the board. Can someone be a scribe for me? Does someone want to um, be a scribe? Would you like to be a scribe? Is it Sando? You, you are Sando. No. no. Oh, where's Sando? Oh, you're Omar. Omar. That's right. Hello, Omar. Do you want to write on the board? Um, sure. Only if you want to. Chalkboard? Yep. All right. Go for it. I'll give you some light. What I want you to do is um, draw like a big, uh, just a table of rows. And maybe we're going to need like about 16 rows now. 
and we're going to number all of those rows. But we'll just draw the rows first of all. I'll give you some light so everyone can see it. So, um, um, uh, Omar's writing a, um, a, a snippet of memory, and it's going to be the memory round about BFFFF. Look, that's a big number. Can everyone see that's a big number? Because it's got lots of digits in it, just like in decimal. The more digits, the bigger the number. That's a whopping big number. So whereabouts in memory are these things going to be stored? It depends if you write big numbers at the bottom or the top. The convention we've been using in the course so far is we putting the big numbers at the bottom, remember? It was just arbitrary completely. So on our big map of memory, just because that's what we're doing with our machine code, if this is a zoomed in map, these are some numbers way down the bottom somewhere. So these variables have been stored down the bottom. Now, if we zoom in on this little bit here, that's a magnifying glass, we're going to get the picture here that Omar's drawing. OK, so, oh, very well done. So these are going to be B, F, 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 7, 4. And what's our smallest number there? 7, 4, 4. All right, so let's start with B, F, 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 7, 4. Yeah, maybe, but I like the blackboard sheet. But we could do it on a spreadsheet, yes. Oh, we wouldn't have to have someone writing it out, but I sort of like that. I mean, it feels like a lecture. Unless you get chalk on your hands, you haven't learnt anything, I reckon. So yeah, we could do it in a spreadsheet, but let's do it, let's do it the old-fashioned way. So this is something, 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 4-4. Four, four. So let's just write this down as 4-4. Four, four. Four, this is address 4-4. Four, four. So this is 4-5. This is 4-6. Thank you very much. This is 4-7. This is 4-8. This is 4-9. This is, what comes after 4-9? Four, 4-A. Four, this is 4-A, this is 4-B, this is 4-C, this is 4-D, this is 4-E, this is 4-F. What comes after F? Four. That's like a 9 in decimal, so we're up to 49 sort of thing. So it's, what's going to be now? 5-0. Five, 5-1, zero. Five, one, five, two. Cool. That's a very neat table, thank you very much. All right, so we've got uh, something stored at 44. What is it? I1 has been stored at 44. Okay, so I1 is stored here. And I1 currently contains zero. So there's a zero stored in here. Where's our next thing stored? 4A, all the way down here. And what's stored there? B5. And then what's stored under B5? Can anyone see? B4. And what's stored under B4? B1. It's in crazy order, isn't it? What's stored under B... I hope I haven't got the optimizer turned on. It's jumbling things around. What's stored under B1? B6. <laughs> what's stored under B6? B2. What's stored under B2? B Have we done them all then? Okay. So what can we say about the size of an integer? Can we say anything at all? We can say it can't be bigger than, how, how, what's the biggest the integer could be? We know it starts here. What's the most memory it can take up? One, two, three, four, five, six. It can't be bigger than six bytes. We don't know that it is actually going to be using all of those six bytes. Maybe the compiler just decided not to allocate these areas of memory to anything. But we know that int is going to be storing something between one and six bytes worth of information. So we're starting to guess how big an int is. How big is a character, unsigned character? We can see, luckily, this forces them to be size one. Can everyone see that? Because they're, they're packed in one apart from each other. So we know, phew, we did manage to work out a type that is exactly one byte for our byte character. So that's looking good. OK, now, um, what if I wanted to, how am I going to, can anyone think of how I could actually tell how big an int is? Yeah. Stick a huge number in, and then what? See what it overflows to? Oh, no, I want to do it this way. I want to use this. Overflow, overflow is undefined. Normally, overflow wraps around, but C doesn't compel it to. But let's just, yes. Have a couple of ints. Have a couple of ints? Oh, yeah, see how much space a couple take up. That's, let's just do that to start with. OK, that's a, very, that's a good solution. I wasn't thinking of that one. And, well, sadly, we can't do that yet. OK, let's do another int. I2, maybe. And let's get rid of our printf's here. They're just confusing us all. I hope this isn't going to muck everything up. 
change all the numbers we've already worked out. I2, I2, I2. All right, let's compile it. Zoom. Let's look at the output here. Where did it store them all? Oh, hang on, I'll paste it in for you. Uh, where's text wrangler? Here we go. Here's the new one. Did everything move or is it in the same spot? I2 is at 40. Ah, ah, good. Okay. Notice, interestingly, it seems to be allocating new things moving up. That's very strange. So let's look here. We've got, what, 43, 42, 41, 40. And this is I2 is stored here. So how big is I2 going to be? Or, or less. So there seems to be two bytes just sitting here not doing anything. That's interesting. But OK, so we've seen I2 takes a, a four bytes or less. So we're getting a really good indication that ints are probably going to be four bytes. Our intuition is telling. We're still not sure they're not two, but our intuition is telling us. How can we check that they actually are four? Yeah. No, we don't know. Uh, the question was, does this mean these guys are the frame pointer or something like that? The answer is, we don't know what's stored here yet. We'll have to find out. The way, the way frame pointers are used, the way that the compiler allocates things to memory, allocating to memory means picking memory locations to store it in, picking which locations to store it in. That's up to the compiler. The C standard doesn't really define that. The compiler can do whatever it likes. So if you're using GCC of this version on this chip, of well, this operating system, it'll do this thing. And you're using another version of GCC on another chip, and it'll do something else. So, so we don't know what's stored in here. One way of finding out what's stored in here is we could go and have a peep. Uh, and often, maybe we'll do that in the lab, or maybe we'll do that today. We could have a peep and see what's stored in there, and then we could just change stuff all around the place and see if this stuff changes. And we could do a bit of detective work to work out what's going on. My guess is, um, uh, it, it's either storing something internally, it needs itself there, I don't think it'll be a frame pointer, because I think that'll be somewhere else. Um, or, when the compiler allocates memory, it turns out to be quite convenient if things start at something that's divisible by a power of two. So it's quite convenient, for example, if all addresses start divisible by four. Any number ending in four zero is going to be divisible by four. Is that true? Yes, in hexadecimal and in decimal, interestingly enough. Any number ending in four zero is going to be divisible by four. So this is... Um, certainly appearing on a, a, um, a, a four-byte boundary. Maybe it wants to allocate things on a four-byte boundary. But hang on, no, this one's, oh yeah, and 4-4, four, four, that's, that's divisible by four. And then Charles maybe doesn't care if they're divisible by four or not. Don't know why it didn't you, don't know. We don't, I guess the short answer, scrap that long answer I just gave, short answer is, I don't know. I don't know, but we might find out. Now, let's try and um, do more detective work and check that it really is taking a whole of those four bytes for the end. How can we do that? Yeah. Ah, I think you're saying what I was hoping someone would say, which is we could pretend that these were unsigned chars and read them back out. Is that what you were saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's do that. We're going to have to, we're going to, in normal languages, we just would have no hope of doing this because the compiler would say, hang on, no, I'm sorry, that's an int. And you go, no, I promise it's an unsigned char. And the compiler would go, no, actually, look at the line above. You just said it was an int. And the compiler wouldn't let you do it. It would be type strict. But C is a very laid back thing, and it says, I think that's an in. And you go, you, what you see is in line one you say, oh, hi, Tim. In line one you say, that's an in. Everyone wave at Tim. Does everyone recognize Tim? Hi. He's here to check if anyone's copied their assignments. <laughs> so <laughs> they've all seen you. Um, Tim will be taking you next week. Oh, I'm away. Uh, so we, uh, oh, it's thrown me completely, the scary Tim sitting in the back. Uh, what was I saying? Better get it right. See if <laughs> I copied this from one of his lectures. That's why I'm sweating. What's that? It's laid back. Oh, yeah, it's C's laid back. It'll go, um, you'll say, uh, this is an int. And it'll go, uh huh, okay. And there'll be a pause, and you'll say, this is a byte. And it'll go, okay. It's <laughs> <laughs> both the power and the shortfall of C. It lets you do stuff, but that's also bad because sometimes uh, you'd rather it was a bit stricter and say, actually, no. <laughs> okay, so it's going to let us do that. So let's try doing that. Let's, let's have a peep at them, first of all. Now, uh, do, do, do. 
What's the easiest way of doing that? Well, what we could do was we're going to need a new type to store, a new, a new type. You've seen a whole lot of types so far. Let's see what the actual type of a pointer looks like. So this ampersand i, that's going to have a value, which is a type. I've said that's a pointer. Let's see what a pointer looks like. A pointer looks like this. We play a little game. Uh, what would you like to call it, by the way? Let's give it a name. We'll call it a, a pointer. We'll call it pointer. OK, that's right. We could say, now if I said int pointer, uh, if I said byte pointer, is that correct? Is pointer a byte? No, it's not. What's pointer? It's an address of a byte. It's a pointer to a byte. Now, in some languages, you would say it like this. If star means pointer to, you could say pointer is a pointer to a byte. That's how you do it in some languages. But in C, we don't. We play a little game. We do it like this. C will accept the other one, but it, don't do it that way. Because uh, it can be bad if you have multiple things online. This is the little game we play. You say, hey, C, I've got an expression here. And when you evaluate this expression, it'll be a byte. And she so goes, OK, OK, tell me what the expression is. And you go, pointer. You say, pointer, what it points to. And it goes, OK, pointer, what it points to is a byte. And it thinks hard and it goes, OK, pointer is a pointer to a byte. And you go, yes, you got it. So it's this little game we play with C. You only ever put things, simple things over here. And then for complex stuff, you give a big expression over here that has that type. And C can work out the type of the thing. Does that make sense? It's, it's, it's like, some people call it like giving types by example. So this is saying pointer is going to be something that points to a byte. So let's go, uh, whoa, what have we got here? Let's go pointer, I could say this, pointer equals the address of B6. Is everyone happy with that? Is pointer now something pointing to a byte? It contains the address of B6, so it is pointing to B6, and B6 is a byte, so everything's okay. All right, let's print out the value of pointer. Pointer has value. I'll print it out in hex. Uh, oh, well, actually, I'll print it as a pointer type, which, is, has a, which will come out in hex. Pointer has value. Da, 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 da. Does that make sense? Let's build it and go. Let's run our program. Move that off to the side. Make it a bit smaller. Oh. Pointer has value. What is the value of it? Oh, I'll do the copy and paste trick. Sorry. Oh, this is very tedious, isn't it? Can everyone just sit down the front tomorrow? Because um, we don't have a lecture tomorrow, and that'll be sort of funny. Okay. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Oh, it's all just gone. Don't worry. Here we go. So pointer has the value B F F F F F F seven four F. Now let's see. Where's seven? What? Oh, everything's allocated in different spots now. Seven, four, seven, four. No, no, it's the same it's one. The I thought they were meant to change location when you recompile it. When I recompile it, it could put it into a different location. I have declared one extra variable, but I, I imagine what it's done is it stored that extra variable up the top and left all these guys in the same place. That's the pattern we've seen so far. When it recompiles it, it's free to allocate them wherever it wants. Oh, yeah, at runtime, it'll put them in, it, it'll move it into different locations too. Yeah, the loader might do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but in this case, no. Even at runtime, it's all in the same spot. And that's good. Well, that's sort of good, though it can be, lead to diabolical uh, um, errors that we'll show you in a couple of weeks being hidden because everything's in the same spot where you expect it to be, so you don't notice that something subtly changed. So remind me, can you remind me in a couple of weeks there's some diabolical things we can do that way? Okay. Um, so let's see, 4f is b3, is that right? 
Has that all stayed or has it moved things around a bit? Ah, oh, it's moved them around. Well, it's allowed to. Every time we recompile, it can make new decisions. So can you guys call out? Where, where's B? What's stored at 4A? B4. B4. What's stored at 4B? B3. What's stored at 4C? B1. What's stored at 4D? B5. What's stored at 4E? What sort of 4F? Okay. So it's saying the address of um, the point has the address 4F pointing to B6. And it is pointing to B6, so it's correct. Is everyone cool with that? Now, given a pointer, how do we get what was stored at that location? Let's have a look at that. So we know the pointer is um, called pointer. How do we find out what's stored at the location of pointer? And before I do that, let's just stick some numbers in here. Let's do a 1 and 2 and 3 in B3 and 4 in B4 and 5 in B5 and 6 in B6. And hope it's not going to do a new allocation. <laughs> hope everything's going to stay in the same spot. All right, so we've got all of that. And we want to print out what B6 is pointing at. We'll say this. Print F the... Cell, well, it's pointing 20 to a byte, isn't it? The byte it points to contains percent D. I'll print it out as a decimal. It'll, it'll cast it to an int. That's okay. And now, how do I find out what's stored at the address that pointer points to? I can put a star in there. Remember, like, that, was, that was the sort of clue when we were playing that game. That's what the star meant. Star pointer means the contents of the memory location that pointer points to. So what are we expecting star pointer to contain? A six. No, a six, because we're hoping it's going to point to B6, and we're hoping that B6 now contains a zero, a six. Let's compile it and run, and let's see what it did. The byte it points to contains a... Six. Can everyone see that? Woohoo! Six. So it worked. Well, that was a lot of trouble. But now we're going to use this neat way of being able to inspect the address of, um, if we know an address, we can expect those memory contents. Now we can do some detective work on, say, I2. What do you think of that? And we can see how it, what it stores inside it. Should we do that? Okay. So let's do this. Where's I2 stored? We won't say our pointer is the address of B6. We'll say it's the address of I2. Now we've got a problem now. What's the problem? It's now a pointer to what type? An int. And I've told it, I've declared pointer as a pointer to a... Let's just see that at the top. Let's see the full scope of my deception here. I've said, oh, pointer is pointing to a byte. And then I've said, oh, I2 is an int. And then I've said, oh, pointer contains the address of I2. So it's pointing to an int, not a byte. But I only want to see that one byte. So I'm going to say, no, 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 no. It's really just pointing to a byte, I promise. And I'm going to say something like, points to byte. I'm going to put a typecast in there. Let's see how it goes. Oh, didn't like it. Oh, what have I done wrong? Byte star, maybe. Here we go. Now let's have a look. The byte it points to contains a zero. Okay. So what did we store in I2? Do you remember? Zero. zero. So this is saying that contains a zero. So it's all looking good so far. I wonder what this guy contains. I wonder what this guy contains. I wonder what this guy contains. Let's print them all out. Now. Here's, what if I did this? I'm doing something slightly naughty now, which is called pointer arithmetic. I'm not just taking the pointer someone's given to me and looking at it. I'm doing some manipulations on it to get a new address, and then I'm going to look in that address. Now, when you do pointer arithmetic in C, it behaves not quite like you'd expect it to behave. If you add 1 onto it, do you think the number increases by 1? 
You would hope so, but not always. If the thing you're pointing to is one byte long, then adding one on will add one to the pointer. But if the thing you're pointing to is four bytes long, and you add one onto it, it'll add four bytes. Terribly confusing. Uh, so I, that's why, uh, going back to your question originally, boom, I wanted it to point to a byte because a byte was one long, so when I add one on, it's going to add one on. Cool. So let's go pointer equals pointer plus one, and then let's... Uh, oh, no, what am I doing? I'm putting it in the wrong spot completely. Let's just kill that altogether. And let's move this point. Let's increase the value of pointer. Oh, oh, what I, oh now I've deleted everything. No, I folded it. Ta-da! All right, let's increase the value of pointer after we've printed it out. All right, so we're going to print out the value the next one points to. Does that make sense? And then we're going to increase it by one again and print out the next byte. And increase it by one again and well, hey, why not do it another time? So we're printing out five values. The point is going to step through. It's going to print out what's stored here, then it's going to print out what's stored here, then it's going to print out what's stored here, then it's going to print out what's stored here, then it's going to print out what's stored here. And we're sort of expecting what? They're all going to be zeros. If they're not all zeros, it tells us something interesting. What if this contains the number seven, for example? What does that tell us? That this integer, which is zero, obviously can't be taking up four bytes. Because if it takes up four bytes, to represent zero and four bytes, it's going to have to pack zeros in all those bytes. So if it's a seven, it's going to tell us it's three bytes or less. We're expecting it to be four, so we'd fall over dead if that happened. But if it's, not, if it's a zero, it's still not telling us it's exactly four bytes, because maybe randomly it's got a zero in it or the compile starts with zero. But OK, it's looking good. So let's see what's in here. Let's run that new program and see what it looks like. Here we go. And the output is zero, 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 zero. Zero, 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 zero. So it's found zeros all the way down. That's sort of what we're expecting. We still haven't got any compelling evidence that a byte is, that an int is four bytes. How can I use this new neat little program now to see that an int is four bytes? Yes? Uh, the fact that when you increase a pointer by one, the memory address will be the time. That was very clever. I wondered if someone would work that out. That's not the way I wanted to do it, but that's a much simpler way of doing it. I guess we could just add one onto a pointer to an int and see how many bytes it increases by. If it increases by four, that tells us ints are four big. That's very clever. We could do that. Like using maxint, that's a clever way of letting the system tell us. But I just want to do it by peeping and detective work. Yep? We could set int one to a really big number. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Let's send int one to, um, instead of setting to, setting to zero, which is boring, let's set it to something like, 256. Why 256? Well, well, it's signed in, uh, so it's definitely going to overflow the first byte and probably go into the second, oh, signed or unsigned. It's going to overflow the first byte and we'll go into the second byte. Because what does 256 look like? It's one followed by how many zeros? Eight zeros. Now, we got an 8-bit byte, so somewhere there's going to be a 1 stored and somewhere there's going to be a 0 stored. And that'll tell us, by the way, if it's big endian or little endian. Can everyone see that? What's that? The program will put out a hex value. Uh, yeah, like it'll print out one and, 1 and some zeros. Yeah, 1 and 2 zeros somewhere. That's right. It won't print it out in binary. Let's have a look at it, guys. Let's see what it looks like. Oh, did I put it in I1? I should have put it in I2. That's a good point. Oh, let's put it in both. OK, if we go, oh, uh, let's, instead in I1, let's store the number 7. No, a number we haven't used, 9. OK, build and go. Let's look at the output. What do we get? We got a 0, 1, 0, 0, 9. We got a 0, 1, 0, 0, 9. OK, what's that telling us? Now, we stored a 9 in I1. And when we looked in the first byte of I1, that's a 9. So that's telling us it's probably putting the least significant byte first, the next most significant byte there, the next most significant byte there, and so on. 
We've seen this is at least two bytes big because to store 256, it stored zero and one, and the most significant byte is second and the least significant byte is third. So if we were to multiply that by 256, what's the next bigger number? Uh, what's the next number? Does anyone know? Does it fit three bytes? <sighs> Why don't I write it in, in hex? I'm pretty sure I can just tell it in hex. I want you to do, how would I write a hex number? Zero x. Oop. I'd like you to stick in, in hex the number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Print that number out for me. And what's it done? Oh, oh no, what? I wasn't expecting that. What's happened? What's happened? What's happened? Oh, because I'm printing them out in decimal. Let's print them out in hex. X, 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 X. X. X, so now it's going to print out the contents of each byte in hexadecimal notation, and it'll be uh, a 7, 8, 5, 6, 3, 4, 1, 2, 9. 7, 8, 6, oh, 5, 6, three, thank you, 3, 4, 1, 2, 9. Okay, can everyone see? So the number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 in hex, it's stored so the most significant digits are here. The next, da -da -da -da, and that tells us ints on this system at this instant are how big? Four bytes. So we've done it. A bit of very crude detective work. Is everyone happy with that? New means yes? No. Ask a question. I'm not really getting that. Okay, so there's sort of probably two separate bits to get. And probably unless you get them both, then you, you fall down the gap in the middle. One is. We've got this area of memory, which is a big chunk of memory, and every byte in it has an address. And this has address 40, this has address 41, this has address 42, 43, 44. We first of all, in the big chunk of code down the bottom here, printed out the address where the compiler stored all the variables. And the compiler said, I'm storing an int here, and I'm storing another int here, and I'm storing a byte here, a byte here, a byte here, a byte here. Does that make sense? So the compiler told us it was storing in it, and we sort of figured, oh, okay, well, look, these ints are qu fairly close together. Uh, if the compiler's packing them in as tightly as it can, that'll tell us the most number of bytes it'll ever need for an int, how many bytes it sets aside for an int. So then we stuck an enormous number in, so it was bound to fill up four bytes, and we went through the memory, and we found those individual four bytes stored in memory. Like, if I said to you, um, you've got some bookshelves, and each bookshelf can hold exactly eight, no, uh, I'm so 19th century, 20th century. You've got some DVD shelves. Each DVD shelf can hold exactly eight DVDs. I tell you that my horror collection starts at this shelf. Richard's horror collection, here's my, it's, this is what my shelves look like. Oh man, that's freaky. It's exactly the same. And I say, my horror collection starts there. And my Western collection starts there. And my rap music collection starts here. <laughs> and you notice, hang on, the shelf he tells me that the horror collection starts at is a long way away from the shelf that he tells me that the Western section starts at. And you think, I wonder if that means he has a whole lot of horror movies or if he's just left gaps in his shelf. How can we find out if he's got, uh, he's got a whole lot of horror movies or just gaps in his shelf? So you say to me, Richard, here are some movies to put in your horror shelf. And you give me eight movies. And then you say to me, what's in the shelf this? And I tell you it's got eight movies. And you go, ah, ah, OK. The eight movies I've given him are in this shelf. And then you say, OK, empty all your shelves out, Richard. That's initializing the variables. And here's 16. And you check, and there's eight in this shelf now, and eight in this shelf, and zero in this shelf, and this zero in that shelf. And you think, OK, that's evidence that he's now putting, uh, using two shelves for his horror. He set four shelves, he set at least two shelves aside for the horror. And then we said, in the big, we didn't go to three, we said, give me eight plus eight plus eight, 32. You gave me 32 horror movies. And you said, stick them in your shelves. I stuck them in, and then you said, how many do you have on each shelf? And we found it was eight, then eight, then eight, then eight. You found, that's evidence that I'm using all those four shelves for horror movies. Now you had to get me get fit. What's that? Give me horror movies. No, I actually, I actually find horror movies very scary. It was it, merely an example. Yeah. We saw stacking, stacking. Yeah, exactly. You should see me sorting my DVDs. I use bubble sort. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> oh, it's so good. If you don't know what bubble sort is, it's a joy that lies away for you later, uh, lies ahead for you later in the course. Okay. So now, does that sort of make more sense now? So that was our investigation. We stored something in. Shh, 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 shh. We stored something in the memory locations, and then. Because we had a pointer to a byte, and a byte is one shelf long exactly, eight bits long exactly, we said we could say, show us the first shelf, show us the second byte, the third byte, and the fourth byte. And we printed out the values in each of them, and lo and behold, they were the values we were sticking in. So that told us it took four. Yes. Any more questions? Yes. That is a very good question. What happens if you gave me 33 horror movies? What happens if we have more data and the ints cannot fit it all in? It will do something then called overflow. Now, the result of an overflow for a signed int in C is undefined. But what most compilers do is they just wrap around to the bottom number. Yeah, so it, it, so it would say, you've got 2 billion c CDs. You get one more, and it would say, oh, you've got negative 2 billion CDs. And you've got to get another 2 billion more to get all the way back to zero. For a signed int, though, it's guaranteed to overflow around to z wrap around to zero. Got it. That's right. And because we got it, remember we said byte here was signed char? So because it's signed, if we overflowed it, it'd go back all the way around. And now you've got enough code to test that out. You don't even have to ask me that. You could now whack in a big number into there and see what it looks like. Yeah, got it. Any more questions? Yes? Shh, shh, shh. Why does one? Oh, we, yeah, we still, you're right. Good question. We haven't answered the original big question. What's, what's stored in here? Why isn't it using that? We haven't even looked in there to see what's in there. Why does it set those aside? Why wasn't it assigning variables to those locations? Is there something special about those locations it's hiding in there that it doesn't want us to see? Are they special in some, we, I, I don't know is the answer, but you could do detective work to find out. What I would certainly do is, Read those values. You reckon you could modify those, this code now to go through and read those values and see what's stored there? You could. Yeah, yeah. Because you've got this pointer thing, and you know you could just keep adding one, it keeps going. So you could just add some more ones to it till you got down to here. And you could peep inside there and see what's in there. And then if that didn't give you any clues, you could change all the other variables in the program and see if what in here changed. And if it didn't change when everything else changed, you'd be scratching your head. And then you could think, oh, well. Damn it, I'll just write some rubbish in there and see if the program explodes and how it does. And you could do all sorts of fiddling around. You might, well, my suspicion is, you might just find it's, they're just not used for anything. Just a decision the compiler made to leave a gap there. But yeah, investigate. I don't know. And if anyone finds out, I would love to hear. Because it would be very interesting to know. Are there any more questions? Last one from, now I should know your name. Uh, Dane. Dane, yes. Are you allowed to lie to the compiler in your tasks and assignments? No, no, because in your tasks and assignments, we want everything to be beautiful. So unless, the, unless the, um, the spec said to do it, it's better not to lie to the compiler. I mean, it, it, it's, uh, you know, it's unstrict enough, even if you do all the right stuff. So, but if you need to, then yeah, sure. But you shouldn't need to. I mean, when, when you do something tricky like that, it's confusing. You know, everyone's brows furrowed much more than normal when I drew that on the board, even, even the people who could program, because you have to stare at it for a little bit to work out what the heck's going on. You never want your brow to furrow when you're reading code. So if you have to do it, do it. If you're writing an operating system, you'll be doing stuff like that all the time. But in your assignments, you shouldn't. You shouldn't have to, yeah. All right, OK. Uh, how are we going for time? Time for a break, OK. Uh, -la 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 -la. So in the break, here's my plan for the break. Shh, shh, shh. There's going to be a, like a two-minute pause. I'm going to say something for about 30 sec 60 seconds after I finish this. Then there'll be a two-minute pause, and you can stand up and do whatever you want. After those two minutes, I'm going to play an audio track. You, are well, you don't have to listen to this audio track, so you could use those two minutes to go outside the building. But everyone who's in, in here when I'm playing the track, please be quiet. Then the audio track will finish, and we'll have two more minutes of just random stuff where the people that hypothetically have gone outside could come back inside, and then we'll resume again. Does that make sense? And the audio track lasts for about five minutes. So that will give us a break of approximately 10 minutes. Now, but I'm going to talk for 60 seconds before the break starts, and here's, because just to introduce what the track's about. Do you, those who went to the extension lecture would have heard me talking about a guy called Turing, Alan Turing. And we finished the extension lecture talking about his amazing Turing test. And this is a test to work out if a computer 
is self-aware or not. Or no, it's not even that sophisticated. It's a test to work out essentially to distinguish between a computer and a person. If a computer and a person were locked away in rooms, so you couldn't physically see them, and you could only communicate by typing, say, and reading on the screen, how would you know that you were talking to a person or a computer? Yes, that was the test. And um, I, I said this is an interesting question because it's not immediately clear how to answer it or even if it has an answer. And also the implications are slightly disturbing because, gee, what if a computer was able to pass this test? Would that mean if we turned it off when it was running, that would be a murder? And what if a human failed this test? You know? <laughs> and, and, and so it starts making us think about what does it mean to be a person? What does it mean to be uh, alive? What does it mean to be aware? These are all the implications that flow on from it. And we mentioned the film Blade Runner, which is a film where these issues are explored and it's quite beautiful, in a beautiful way. Jane Goodall, who I'm about to play a voice clip from in this five minute break, is the famous uh, lady that deals with um, uh, the, uh, the uh, what would you call them, the, uh, the primate family. So she's done lots of work sitting in amongst I'm trying to remember, is it chimpanzees or? It's chimps, it's chimps. She's done a lot of work sitting in amongst chimp communities. She did this when she was quite young. She's been doing it all her life, just observing them and making notes about them and doing all sorts of anthropological studies. And she's famous and fantastic and cool. And last year or the year before, the year before, she came out to UNSW and gave a series of talks. Now here, this is going to be an extract from one of her talks where she talks about a particular chimp called Jojo. And uh, it's going to go for five minutes. And it's just interesting. So uh, two, minute, two minute pause and then Jojo starts. So get up and move out, and if you're not staying out, at least get up and jiggle around so the blood mushes around a bit. Um, I was in the physics lab the other day, yes. and I remember holding down the control key and scrolling forwards, and it yes. just zoomed in the operator. Ah, oh, control. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. 